Okay, so um, this is the first of our uh, joint neurophilosophy seminars of uh, 2021. Uh, we've had, I think, five in, uh, in uh, 2020, and we will have certainly several more um, um, this year. Um, so a few, just a brief, few brief announcements. Uh, um, as before, I mean, these are part of the um, neurophilosophy of, uh, of free will uh, consortium that, uh, uh, that uh, we have uh, ongoing, uh, um, supported by the John Templeton Foundation and the Fetzer Institute. Um, one, one thing to know that we're trying, uh, out for the first time is uh, there's going to be um, kind of like a, a, a social slash uh, way to ask and uh, ask more questions, discuss more things with the speakers and with each other um, after uh, this event on uh, gather.com. Uh, we will share uh, the in information uh, later over the, the chat. Um, uh, that's one thing. Another thing to note is we have an early career joint talk competition that we are hosting. So uh, people who are um, starting from uh, post uh, uh graduate students, postdocs, and, and, and up to, uh, and, but I mean, not those who have tenure, up to, to pre-tenure uh, uh, assistant profs um, can apply for this. And um, um, uh, the, the, the winning talks, it's going to be a joint talk between a philosopher and a neuroscientist. Uh, you can find information on the Neurophilosophy of Free Will website uh, under um, events. And um, the, so we will host the winning, um, the, the, the winning talk on this platform. There's also going to be a small honorarium involved. And you're very welcome to submit, uh, uh, submit proposals until April 1st. Um, and one last thing to, to the PIs who are panelists on this, uh, we ask that you send your questions to uh, all at attendees rather than, than only to the panelists because otherwise the other attendees cannot see these questions. So please let's communicate use, uh, via the all attendees uh, option. Uh, with that, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Mathieu Landry who is uh, our moderator, and we'll take it from here. Go ahead, Mathieu. All right, thanks, Uri. Uh, before we get going, I, I just wanted to maybe acknowledge something here or highlight something. So I would like to wish all women who are attending this event and were uh, researchers, thinkers, uh, happy International Women's Day. Uh, I think that we still need to recognize that still today there's evidence that highlights gender inequality, especially in academia. Uh, and as a community, I think it's important to remind ourselves that we should continue to thrive for not only equality of rights, but also thrive to remove barriers that bi bias against women in the workplace and elsewhere. So uh, I thought that was important to recognize this today uh, being March 8th. Um, so today we have the privilege of listening to two uh, world-renowned experts in the topic of free will, agency, motor control, action, and decision-making. So I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll present. So uh, first, Alfred Milley is uh, William H. and Lucille T. Workminster Professors of, uh, of Philosophy at uh, Florida State University. Uh, he has authored uh, 12 monographs, including his latest one, Manipulated Agents, A Window to Moral Responsibility. He has edited several volumes and wrote more than 200 articles and book chapters on various topics, such as uh, free will, intentions, volition, agency, moral responsibility, and self-control. Uh, during his prolific career, Professor Milley has received several prizes and awards, including the American Philosophical Association 2013 uh, Senders Book Prize for his book, Effective Intentions uh, at Oxford University Press. Now presenting with uh, Professor Miller is, uh, his co-presenter is Marcel Brass, who is the Einstein Professor of Social Intelligence at the Berlin School of Mind and Brain at Humboldt University in Berlin. 
Uh, Marcel has published more than 200 scientific articles on the psychology and the cognitive neuroscience of free will, agency, motor control and action, executive control beliefs, instructions, as well as on human performance. His labs investigate the social cognitive mechanisms underlying our ability to successfully navigate our social environment. And he also studies the neurocognitive me mechanisms underlying intention and cognitive control, human cognitive flexibility and human volitions. So the day both speaker will present uh, uh, one of their most recent collaborative efforts on why they think that Libet style experiment uh, experiments do not disprove free will. Uh, so they'll highlight uh, one of the model that they present, so the coin top model. So I'll let them describe uh, the acronym and what it means or what it stands for. And um, I just wanted to highlight that this model was recently featured in their article that was published in Neuroscience and Bio Biobehavioral Reviews. So their presentation will last for about between 50 to 60 minutes. And then we'll have about 30 and 40 minutes of Q&A. And um, you'll be able to ask questions in two ways. So one way in which you can ask the question is just by raising your hand and uh, um, then you'll be able to ask your question out loud. Or if you prefer, there's also a Q&A box uh, where you will be able to ask your question and I'll do my best to screen the questions and, and to see uh, if I could put some questions together. And now that every seminar, there's been quite a few questions and, and it, it's been difficult to get through all of them. So, uh, and perhaps one last thing that I wanted to highlight is that we would like for this particular seminar, maybe to encourage trainees to contribute to the discussion. So if you are a trainee and you would like to ask a question, I will, uh, uh, certainly for the first few minutes of the q and I will give you priority. So maybe uh, just flag it to me. I think you can flag it to me uh, um, just by sending me a message personally if, if, if you're a bit shy. Um, or also if, if I know that you're a trainee, I'll, I'll give you priority, like I said, at the beginning of the Q&A. Uh, with that said, uh, I'll pass the baton to uh, Al Mele. Thanks. Marcel, do you want to share your screen? One of the two Marcels. Okay. Um, so the plan is I will talk for up to 15 minutes on background to the view, and then Marcel will take over and do all the hard work. And then I'll talk about uh, free will for maybe 10 minutes. I think if you want to interrupt me, just go ahead and do it, uh, and then I'll adjust, especially if anything I say is unclear. Uh, <clears throat> I'm told I have now old uh, speech muscles, and I get hoarse, and I'm seeing a, a voice uh, therapist. So if you have trouble hearing me, let me know. Will the recording be available publicly, somebody asks. I don't know. Do you know, Matthew? Yes, I believe all seminars are available on YouTube. So all the recordings can, and so if you go onto the website for Neuro uh, Will something, you, you can see the link there. Uh, otherwise just do a, a search in, in YouTube and I think you'll be able to find them. Okay. All right, so let me launch into the, uh, this is just a conceptual background for the paper. It's, uh, it's how I've been thinking about things for a very long time. And I find it useful to have this conceptual apparatus present uh, in my head when I think about uh, results of neuroscience experiments. So decisions to do things or not to do things, as I think of them, are momentary mental actions of intention formation and they are responses to uncertainty about what to do. Um, now, I know some people like to reserve the word action just for actions involving uh, overt bodily motion, but uh, there are mental actions too. Think about reciting a poem in your head or reciting a prayer in your head or counting backwards from 100 by three silently in your head. These are all mental actions. 
And I think of deciding to do a thing as a mental action too. So to decide to X uh, is to form an intention to X. Uh, some decisions are preceded by reasoning about what to do and some aren't. There are snap decisions. Uh, there are decisions you make in Buridan's ass cases where there's nothing to reason about. Um, when a decision is preceded by reasoning, I don't count the reasoning as part of the decision. The decision would be the momentary mental action at the uh, end of the process. And I should add that I'm not saying that everybody should think of decision like this. If you have your own view of it and you like it, you know, stick with it. But if you don't, uh, this is one that you might be able to use and find uh, useful. Um, Oh, and we don't claim that decisions have to be conscious. So we leave it open that Libet might be right, that we make uh, unconscious decisions and then become conscious of them later. Oh, and what's the connection between uh, deciding and free will? If you look at a philosophical work on free will, the phenomenon that gets the most attention is deciding or choosing. I use those words interchangeably. Um, not desiring, not urges, not wanting. <clears throat> and why is that? Well, because deciding or choosing has a claim to being something that we directly control or something that's directly up to us, where it's not directly up to us what urges we have at a time or what desires crop up at a time. Uh, so deciding or choosing for philosophers, especially philosophers who work on free will, is a very special uh, notion. Okay, so now for intentions, my, the slogan I like is their executive attitudes toward plans. And plans are the contents of intention. Plans can be very simple. I just uh, executed an intention to snap my fingers and my plan was just a representation of a to be performed finger snapping. And plans can be complicated too. The executive attitude part is this, the primary or most fundamental function of intentions, as I think about intentions, is to get themselves executed. And so in this way, intentions <clears throat> to do a thing differ from wanting to do a thing or having an urge to do a thing or desiring to do a thing. Those states, I think of as having the basic function of contributing to the production of an intention to do a thing. So wanting, desiring, having an urge are a step further removed from action than intentions are, at least as we're thinking about intentions uh, in this paper. Um, yeah, not all intentions are formed in acts of deciding I think we have lots of routine intentions for routine behavior. So every day when I'm in Tallahassee, which is all the time now, unfortunately, I uh, drive to my parking lot at the university and I walk up the stairs to my office and I unlock the door. And I figure I intentionally unlock the door. I intend to unlock the door when I do. But I've never had to decide what to do when I get to my office door. I've never been uncertain about what to do. I just haul off and unlock the door. And if I had heard a fight in my office or something of that kind, then I would have been uncertain and I probably would have needed to make a decision. But under normal conditions, no. So not all intentions are formed in acts of decision making. Um, I distinguish among different kinds of intentions. Uh, these distinctions are, are very common. We use different terminology, but we usually mean the same thing. Um, so based on targeted times, there are proximal, distal, and mixed intentions. A proximal intention is an intention you have now to do a thing now. A distal intention is an intention you have now to do a thing later. Like right now, I have an intention to do this uh, avatar meeting thing after our session. And a mixed intention is an intention like this, an intention to start now running a mile. So it's got a proximal part, 
start now, and it's got a distal part, you know, complete this task. Um, also based on content form, uh, we distinguish between unconditional and conditional intentions, which is important for the uh, coin top model. And uh, all the intentions I've talked about so far are unconditional intentions. Conditional intentions have an if-then structure or a when-then structure. Um, and let me give you some examples from a Libet uh, experiment scenario. So it was 2005. I was a subject in uh, an experiment by uh, Mark Hallett. I wonder if Mark is here. He's usually here. Yeah, there he is. I see his name anyway. Uh, yeah, 2005, and the plan was I give a lecture to Mark's group, then there's a Q&A, then they take me up to the lab, and I'm a subject in a Libet experiment, and then they take me to dinner at Mark's house. And I wanted to be a naive subject, so my plan was to sit in the chair and wait for urges to flex to crop up in consciousness so I could report them and flex as soon as I you know, felt the urge. And nothing like that was happening. I was just sitting there uh, stupidly. And I thought, well, I can't be looking so stupid, so I have to come up with a plan. And my plan <clears throat> was to say now from time to time to myself and to flex as soon as I could in response to the silent now saying. So this was silent. It was all done in my head. So one intention I had then was a conditional one, was to flex whenever I said, now. And then what you might wonder is, so do I just have that generic uh, conditional intention? Or on each go, do I have a conditional intention like this? Next time I say now, flex. Those are two different possibilities. And then also you might wonder, if I have either of those conditional intentions, and I say now, does the now saying plus the conditional intention result in the proximal intention to flex? Or does the process work uh, without a proximal intention? And there, what you're going to say is whatever you think should be said about a go signal experiment. So when you get the go signal, does that prompt a proximal intention? Or do you get by without a proximal intention? You have the conditional intention to do x. When you get the go signal, you get the go signal. Are those two things sufficient to generate muscle motion, or do you need a proximal intention too? We don't take a stand on that. But uh, if there is no proximal intention there, then it looks like there's no proximal intention in the Libet style study. And the big problem is supposed to arise out of when the proximal intention emerges. OK. Uh, I don't know how long that took, probably not very long. Uh, I think nine minutes, and I'm going to stop there. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I will walk you through the next 30 slides, and luckily, my talking time on each slide will be much faster than else. Um, before I start introducing our model, I unfortunately have to introduce the type of um, task that we try to explain this with this model, namely Libet style TARS. And I know most of you have heard that um, very often, but nevertheless, I think it's very crucial that we are on the same page. So I will briefly describe um, the type of task that we try to explain with our model, namely Libet-style task. So in the classical Libet experiment, participants have to press a key and they can decide when to press the key. And while they are deciding, they see a clock hand rotating on the computer screen like this. Then they decide to press the key and press the key and afterwards, they have to indicate when they decided to press a key, the reported intention, or W. Furthermore, of course, we know when they actually press the key. 
And the first observation of Libet was that this time differs by about 200 milliseconds. So between the W and the movement onset, there is an interval of about 200 milliseconds. Now the ingenious idea of Libet was to combine this paradigm with an EEG measurement. So he measured an event-related potential with EEG that is called the readiness potential. It is back average from the movement. And what he found um, was that the onset of the readiness potential preceded um, the reported intention by a few hundred milliseconds. And from this, he um, draw the conclusion that our conscious intentions are not really kicking off the whole thing. Something unconscious is happens be happening before that in principle um, kicks off the whole intentional action business in a way. Now, there are variants of these paradigms, variants where participants not only have to decide um, when to execute an action, but also which action to execute. I think one of the first um, publications of this is by Patrick Haggard and Martin Eimer from 99. They used a variant where participants not only had to decide when to act, but also which action to execute. Here I will refer to a study um, that I was co-authoring from um, John Dillon Haynes group, um, in which participants also had to decide which action to execute and when to execute this action. And while they were doing this task, they saw these letters on the screen, they press the key, and afterward they had to indicate which letter was on the screen when they decided to press the key. Now we used fMRI, so the hemodynamic response to predict intentional decisions of participants. Um, and with pattern cl classification, we were able to predict these decisions with the okay um, accuracy of 60% up to eight seconds before participants became aware of their decision. So these are the paradigms we try to cover um, in our um, coin top model. Now the classical interpretation of these findings is that these neural activity preceding conscious intentions reflect the outcome of an unconscious decision. Now, the interpretation that we would like to put forward is different. We would like to argue that neural activity preceding conscious intentions reflects a decision process based on minimal information. Now, we are not the first one who um, made this proposal. This has been um, proposed by Adina Roskis. There is a nice article by Stefan Bode from 2014 where he um, uh, puts forward this idea. I think what is maybe to some degree different between this proposal and, and our model is that we try to integrate different ideas and findings from the literature in one integrated um, model that try to also cover aspects of the Libet task that have received less attention so far. So for example, the, ro the role of um, instructions and conditional intentions in Libet style experiments. I, I would like to uh, emphasize that, that our um, ambition was not to develop a mathematical model for such decision processes, but rather to use some general principles of a specific type of model to explain um, Libet style TARS. Okay. So the proposal that I will now try to put forward is that Libet style tasks are simple decision-making tasks with minimal information. And in order to outline this idea in more detail, I first will refer to perceptual decision-making tasks because there is a very extensive literature on perceptual decision-making. And this perceptual decision-making literature 
um, deals with these kind of tasks, so random dot motion tasks, for example. So you see um, dots on the screen that move in different direction and you have to decide in which direction the dots are moving. So either to the right or to the left. And in some trials, this decision is relatively easy because it's relatively easy to see in which direction the dots are moving. There's a lot of evidence for a specific direction. But there are other trials where this is quite complicated because there is minimal evidence or even no evidence um, in which direction the dots are moving. Nevertheless, of course, we are able to come up with a decision. Now, these type of perceptual decision tasks have been formalized in these integration to bound models. Here, the basic idea is that we have two decisions, pressing the left or pressing the right key. And then we are accumulating evidence, perceptual evidence from the stimulus until a specific bound is hit. And if this happens, then we decide to do A and initiate the motor response that is related to it. So there are a number of uh, important components here. So first of all, you have a starting point. If the decision is not biased beforehand, then this is in the middle between the two alternatives. Then you have an evidence accumulation process that can be more or less steep. And then you have the point where um, the accumulation uh, uh, process hits the threshold. And this is the, the, the point when the decision is made. Now, um, one basic idea of this coin top model is that Libet style experiments are nothing more or less than these kind of decision um, processes. The only difference is that in Libet type of experiments, we don't have perceptual information on which we can base our decision, but we use endogenous information, internal information, um, to, to come up with a decision. But otherwise, they are very similar to classical decision models. So you have an evidence accumulation process, then you have a threshold, and when this threshold is crossed, um, you decide, and then you would initiate your response and you respond. Now, if you assume that Libet type of experiments are based on very similar principle than these perceptual decision-making tasks, you have to address a number of questions. And this is what I will try to do um, in the next 20 uh, minutes or 25 minutes. First of all, what kind of evidence is accumulated in Libet style tasks? How is the threshold determined? What is the role of conscious intentions here? How can we account for the V2 idea of Libet? And the last question I would like to uh, uh, briefly address is, do RP like brain waves always lead to action? Now, the first question is what kind of evidence is accumulated in these um, uh, Libet style tasks? So as I already mentioned, participants have no perceptual evidence. The only evidence they can base their decision on is endogenous evidence. And one possibility is that they are monitoring introceptive states, for example, the activation in their motor system. And they use this kind of evidence to decide when to execute an action or which action to execute. Now, um, the problem is that these um, introceptive signals are presumably also not very strong and do not provide a lot of evidence um, for the decision. So the question is how people can then decide. And here, um, an idea comes into play that I think was first systematically introduced by Aaron Scherger, namely that maybe um, these kind of decisions are based on random fluctuations in the motor system. Um, 
In this now I think seminal study, Aaron Sugar um, argued um, that lipid like um, TARS and the readiness potential that is in, observed in these TARS is in principle based on putting a threshold on random fluctuations in a neural system. Um, and I will briefly explain this idea in my very simple minded psychological terms, even though in the talk by, by Idina and, and Aaron, this is uh, extensively outlined. So assume you are standing at the shore in Northern France, as I did a while ago, and you see the waves rolling onto the shore. Some of these waves will cross this arbitrary line that I have drawn here, and others don't. Oh, the noise is a little bit annoying, sorry for that. Um, but it makes the whole experience a little bit more vivid. So now if you average the waves that cross this arbitrary line, like this one here, and this one here, you will end up with something that looks like a readiness potential because the small waves will be averaged out and the large waves will accumulate. So then you have something like a readiness potential. Interestingly, some have interpreted this finding as evidence that the readiness potential is a kind of methodological artifact. I think that one could also interpret it as a basis for intentional decisions in the situation where you don't really have external evidence. Now, if you, comp if you combine this idea um, of a kind of threshold crossing mechanism with the idea of the prepared reflex, you can um, develop a strategy that participant might use in libet style experiments. So participants in the beginning of the experiment of the trial might um, formulate a conditional intention um, that then might trigger the proximal intention. And this conditional intention might be, if I feel an urge to act, I will press a key. Now, participants might monitor introceptive signals that indicate activation level in their motor system. And whenever this activation level crosses a specific threshold uh, or gets a specific intensity, this defined the triggering condition that then might activate the proximal intention um, or the action initiation process. So by combining this idea of monitoring interoceptive states in your motor system with this idea of conditional intentions, you can um, explain how participants might um, solve the Libet task. Now, a second question is, how is this threshold determined in these kind of Libet style experiments? And here the experimental instruction comes into play. So um, remember, for example, the fMRI TARS that I described in the beginning, the soon study. In this study, we asked participants to take a lot of time to come up with a decision. Um, and in such a situation, participants might put the threshold relatively high in order to avoid that they always respond after a few hundred milliseconds. So in the soon study, participants took 10 or 14 seconds um, to come up with a decision. However, in the classical Libet TARS, where participants usually have a response window that is much shorter, maybe two to three seconds, participants might put the threshold much lower to ensure that they um, come up with a decision in the response window. So in principle, the experimental instruction and the context of the experiment defines 
the parameters of the decision model, if you can say. Okay. So to briefly summarize the role of task, the role of task instructions in these Libet style experiments. Participants might form conditional intention that define triggering conditions for the proximal intention to press a key. And the parameters in, partic in particular, the threshold um, might be dependent on task instructions that participants receive in the beginning of the experiment. Now, another question is, what is the role of conscious intentions in all this? And here the basic idea is that if you ask participants to report the time of conscious intention, this point in time might correspond to the point in time um, when the accumulation process hits the threshold. And if this is the case, that would be very interesting because it would correspond to our intuition that we decide at the moment when we become aware of our decision. Now, um, there is some interesting evidence for this idea um, from perceptual decision-making again. There is a very nice study from Kang and colleagues from 2017 where they simply combined a kind of perceptual decision-making task, such a random dot motion task, um, with a um, Libet clock, where participants had to judge the moment in time when they decided for one or the other um, option, in a way. And then they tested in their model how this subjective decision time um, uh, fits into the model. And what they could show was first of all, that, um, uh, uh, that if they provided a lot of evidence, W occurred earlier compared to a situation when uh, less evidence um, uh, was provided. So this already um, indicates um, that W might be related to um, the uh, uh, threshold hitting process. And furthermore, if they use W to model their data, they got a very good model fit. So um, to briefly conclude the role of conscious intentions, when participants are instructed to report their conscious intentions to act, the time of conscient, conscious intention might be the time um, when the accumulation process reaches the threshold. And as I said, this would be quite um, uh, congruent to our intuition that we decide in this moment. Now, another interesting question is whether this kind of integration to bound model of Libet style TARS can also explain um, the veto idea of Libet. Um, Vito came, uh, Libet came up with this um, idea that maybe we cannot choose when to execute an action and which action to execute, but as soon as we become aware of our intention to act, we can at least stop the action um, afterwards. Um, Libet's evidence for that was not very convincing, um, I have to say. But um, the other experiments and, and with Patrick Haggard, I have done some of these experiments. There is some evidence that maybe um, one can empirically show such veto process happening after um, people become aware of their intention. But the question is, how can that happen? And the question is, I think very relevant because if you look at the timing of the Libet experiment, it's very difficult to squeeze in such a veto idea into um, the timeline because usually participants become aware of their intention to act about 200 milliseconds before um, they respond. Now, they first have to become aware of this 
um, intention, and then they have to decide to stop it. There is not much time in these 200 milliseconds to do that. In particular, if you take into account that presumably from 130 milliseconds, maybe 100 milliseconds before the response, you can't stop a response anymore um, that you already initiated. So in principle, you have only 70 or 90 milliseconds um, to veto your conscious action. However, um, the possibility to, to try to integrate this veto idea into um, an integration to bound model um, might be an interesting idea. So the basic idea is here that participants accumulate evidence until a threshold is hit. And this is the moment in time when they become aware of their decision and they actually decide. Now, um, these kind of integration to bound models also have demonstrated that evidence accumulation doesn't stop with the decision, but continues after the, the decision. So if you now define a second conditional intention, namely that when the accumulation process hits the threshold again, for example, this triggers again a conditional uh, uh, proximal intention to stop the action, then you might have enough time with this reflex-like um, uh, mechanism to stop the action after you became aware of it and before you reach the point of no return. Okay, so the last point I would like to discuss is a point that has been relatively heavily discussed in the literature recently. Namely, do RP like brain growth necessarily um, lead to action? If you take the integration to bound model of intentional actions seriously, um, you, you have to, in principle, say this is not very likely because it can happen that evidence accumulates but doesn't hit the threshold. And then um, it wouldn't lead to the, de the decision to act, let alone an action. So in principle, from this perspective, it is very likely that sometimes information are integrated, but not to the point where they lead to a decision. Um, and there is some evidence um, for, for this idea. For example, um, again, uh, the group of John Dern Haynes, Schulze Kraft, have done a study in which they predicted online predicted intentional actions from EEG activity. And they found a relatively large number of false positives. So the, the um, algorithm was predicting that participants are going to act, but then they didn't act. So there seemed to be some evidence for the idea that maybe RP-like brainwaves happen uh, not only when participants decide to act. Now, there is a recent controversy um, uh, um, about that. And Travers and colleagues um, uh, recently published a study in which they use relatively complicated methodological arguments to argue that these kind of RP-like signals in the EEG do not correspond to what you see before an action to a real RP in a way. Um, honestly, this is a little bit beyond my methodological um, expertise, but I think there is other evidence that strongly supports um, the idea that um, people can, in a way, change their mind before becoming aware of a decision. And here I would like to refer to a study that was carried out by Ariel Fürstenberg, who was also co-author on the paper. It's a very nice study. It's not very often cited, even though I think it is a very interesting idea that he is putting forward here. He um, tries to show that if you um, subliminally prime participants to carry out an action, this leads to an action tendency that can be 
overwritten before participants even become aware of it. And I would like to briefly describe um, this experiment. So the paradigm that he used is very similar to a classical subliminal priming paradigm. Participants see a fixation cross in the beginning. Then they see a prime, which could be either a directional prime, so to the right or to the left, or a neutral prime. Then this prime is masked, masked and these masks prevent participants from becoming aware of the prime. So if you ask participants afterwards whether they, have saw, whether they saw a prime and which or which prime they saw, they can't tell you. And then participants get a target, either a target that tells them what to do, press a right key or press a left key. And the interesting um, innovation of Ariel here was to also use a choice cue. So here participants could choose which key to press. Um, the paradigm looks like this. So participants don't see anything, then they see a target, this was a choice cue, and then they press a key. Now you can look at the readiness potential, at the lateralized readiness potential, which um, happens briefly before participants execute the reaction and later than the classical readiness potential. So the lateralized readiness potential in principle um, indicates activation in the motor cortex. So if you press a right key, your left motor cortex will be activated. And if you press a, a left key, your right motor cortex will be activated. Now you can measure this activity and compare it and then um, you get activity for the hand with which you respond, um, the right hand if you respond with the right hand or the left hand if you respond with the left hand and the other hand. And what these classical subliminal action priming studies have demonstrated before, this is literature that is a few decades old, is that in congruent cases, so when the prime tells you to press a left key, for example, and the target tells you also to press a left key, then activation only goes in the direction of the response hand. However, in, incongru in the incongruent situation, when the prime tells you to use the other hand um, and the target, so for example, the left hand and the target tells you to use the right hand, then you see a lateralized readiness potential in the direction of the prime which is then overwritten by the task instruction, by the target, um, by the response hand activation, so to say, that then leads to the response. Now, the interesting question is, what happens in the situation where participants can choose themselves which action to execute? So they get the subliminal primes, but then decide themselves which action to execute. First of all, behavior. So if you look at behavior, in participants choose more often to go with the prime than against the prime. So congruent choices are um, significantly more often, happen significantly more often than incongruent choices. This shows that the prime influences choice behavior. Furthermore, Congruent um, uh, responses are faster than incongruent responses. I will leave aside the neutral condition. here. Now, the crucial question is what happens um, in these choice trials with the lateralized readiness potential? And here, two lines are relevant, I mean, the black line, which is, is a congruent uh, condition where participants choose the response that was primed. And the red line is the incongruent condition where participants choose the response that was not primed. And as you can see here, in the incongruent condition, the lateralized readiness potential developed in the direction of the choice participants didn't make. And then this is overruled and participants go for the other response. And keep in mind that participants are absolutely not aware um, of these um, primes. So in principle, 
they overrule a kind of response tendency that uh, they are not aware of. And in integration to bound models, this is relatively clear. As long as this evidence doesn't, or accumulation doesn't cross a threshold, in principle, other processes can overrule it and lead to a different decision. I think this is very neat evidence for the idea that um, there might be um, evidence accumulation toward the threshold that then can be overruled and that before participants become aware of any intention. Okay, so this is a um, summary model um, of our, uh, or the summary graph of our coin top model. Um, there are a few uh, crucial elements, namely the task instructions and the conditional intention that participants form in the beginning of the experiment, which determine in principle the decision process. So they determine um, the bound. They also determine which evidence is accumulated and how fast and they might define conditional intentions that if the triggering conditions are met, might um, initiate um, the conscious proximal intention. And I would like to finish with briefly outlining some of the implications of um, this perspective of um, Libet style TARS. So first of all, brain activation um, preceding conscious intentions reflects a decision process rather than a decision. And this is a point that has also been made by Adina Rovskis and Aaron Sugar and others. The decision is only taken when the decision threshold is crossed, which is a moment of conscious intention. So in principle, it can happen that some kind of evidence accumulates towards the threshold, but then it's overwritten by other evidence. And before the threshold isn't hit, um, the decision is made. The decision process is configured by task instruction and conditional intentions, which participants form in the beginning of the experiment. So the, what happens outside the trial, so to say, before participants really um, do the trial is very important in the Libet task. And the type of evidence that is accumulated depends on the type of decision. So if it is a perceptual decision, people will try to accumulate perceptual evidence. If it is a Libet style type of decision, they might um, use interoceptive signal, whatever signal they get to come up with a decision. The interesting final implication of this is that Libet style TARS um, and meaningful decision TARS, such as perceptual de decision TARS, do not differ regarding the decision process, but only regarding the type of information the decision is based on. And this to some degree rehabilitates um, the Libet task in a sense. It's a kind of decision task, like other decision tasks as well. Simply the evidence is different. And with this, I would like to hand over to Al again. Okay, thanks Marcel. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about implications for free will. I think that over the last 15 years or so, enthusiasm uh, for Libet-style arguments against uh, free will has waned, uh, due partly to work by people here. So this now is not as exciting as it would have been 15 years ago, but I will talk about the implications. <clears throat> And I think one way to, to structure a brief discussion of it is to look at this argument. I think this captures uh, Libet's line of thinking. So premise one, in Libet style experiments, all the decisions on which data are gathered are made unconsciously. And then there's a generalization from that to, so probably all decisions are made unconsciously. And then there's a theoretical premise no unconsciously made decision is freely made. So in order to be free, a decision has to be consciously made. Uh, so probably no decisions are freely made. Now to say that a decision is made unconsciously is just to say that the person isn't conscious of making it 
when he or she makes it. That, that's all it is to say. And the coin tab model indicates that decisions are not made nearly as early as Libet says they are. He says they're made about 550 milliseconds before muscle motion. Now, whatever you think about W time, whether you think it's reliable or not reliable, it looks like the evidence is indicating that decisions are made around W time, uh, much later than Libet thought, much closer to the time of action. And then that would be evidence that they're not made unconsciously after all, that if there are decisions there, proximal decisions or proximal intentions, uh, they're made consciously. And that just explodes the argument. Premise one goes and the argument is gone. But suppose that premise one were true. Would we be able to feel good about generalizing from these decisions to all decisions? And people here have done good work on this too. Um, notice how different Libet style decisions are from many decisions we make. They're arbitrary decisions. Nothing hangs on which way you go, whether you flex now or a little bit later or a little bit earlier. Uh, and subjects are told not to think about what to do. So the instructions shove consciousness off to the side. In the case of many decisions that we make, we care about things, we reason in advance about what to do, we make decisions on the basis of reasoning, conscious reasoning. And it could be that consciously reasoning about what to do raises the probability of conscious deciding, that is, of being aware of deciding when you make the decision. Premise three, uh, I've never taken a stand on. It, it's a purely theoretical premise. Uh, we can argue about it one way or the other. But premise one looks false. Premise two looks unwarranted. Uh, so the argument uh, should go to bed and never come back. And I think uh, in the interest of having plenty of time for discussion, uh, that's all I want to say. All right. Thank you for uh, a great talk. Uh, uh, I, I hope that um, our participants will have questions and a bit of pushback, hopefully, um, on some of these ideas. So um, first, my lab mate, uh, uh, Thomas Dominic, uh, raises the point that uh, there seem to be increasing or accumulating evidence that W time actually reflects some kind of retrospective uh, constructions, right? And there seem to be growing evidence in, in that direction. So uh, therefore the reported intention, and here I'm, I'm quoting his questions, might not be the experience at W time at all. If that is true, how would, the influence, or how would that influence interpretation of the W reports in the coin top model? Mm -hmm. And again, just before you answer, I, I wanna emphasize that if some trainees have questions, I'll, I'll uh, prioritize those for um, right now. You wanna take that one, Marcel? Yeah, I, I, I can start with that. I think that is a very good point. And I first wanted to talk about this point because they are interesting experiments. I mean, they are not extremely new, but I think they are very convincing that show that things that happen after the response even influence W. Um, so there are these experiments um, where, uh, where um, a tone is presented after the action and the tone is delayed and the delay of the tone influence W. And this is of course very difficult to accommodate in such a model. And I think we couldn't accommodate um, this in our model. I think you have to assume a different mechanism, an additional mechanism to, to understand such a delay of W based on things that have happened after the action. And there things like intentional binding or something like that comes into play. 
so that in principle people are integrating information, action information, action effect information, and this influences W time. I don't think that this determines W time. So I wouldn't agree that um, W time is only um, constructed retrospectively. But of course, participants report about W after they have carried out the response and therefore think that happen after the response might influence it. So I, I don't think that it's really, that it really invalidates the idea that W um, time in this kind of task corresponds to the moment of decision making, but you can in a way distort this W time with these kind of experimental manipulations. That would be my idea. But I agree that in this model, it's very difficult to, to, to account for um, these kind of findings. Uh, I have no uh, So it seems that uh, Thomas might have a, um, uh, a follow up question. So I'm just going to allow you to talk, uh, Thomas. So here you go. Thank you, Matt. Um, I might want to clarify. I understand the argument that by the Banks and Nation study with the delayed uh, sounds does not necessarily invalidate the W time. But I, what I'm rather talking about is uh, a study that we did in 2017 in which we asked the subjects to report W times, but one group had to report W times without knowing that we might also ask about a different thing, which was, the, which was the M time. So in one group, we asked the subjects to just report the W times uh, 40 times, and then they reported the M times. And in the other group, they first reported the M times. And mm -hmm. in the second task, they reported the W times. And what we found was that there was no difference between the W times and M times when the W times were reported first, which suggests that the subjects didn't actually have an intention to report, they just reported the time of the action. And it was only after they were first introduced to the M time, to the, to the idea that first they, sh they should report some kind of movement. And only after that, we asked them about an intention, that intention actually replicated Libet's results. Mm -hmm. I hope it, this is clear. Yeah. Um... I'm not 100% whether, so, so you combined W time with M time and under which condition you, you, you find an earlier W time? So earlier W time you find if uh, the subjects already know that we are going to ask about a movement and then we ask them about an intention. If we asked about the intention on its, on its own, they will just report the same time as they report when they when we ask about the, the M time. But is that consistent with um, with Libet type of experiments? Because there you only ask them about the intention, and they report the intention two hundred milliseconds about before the action. If you do an independent uh, study where participants have to report. The motor response, I don't think that th there will be a kind of 200 millisecond um, um, anticipation of the motor response. So I don't completely understand how this can explain the classical um, uh, preceding of W time of 200 milliseconds in Libet style of experiments where they are not asked about the end time. Mm -hmm. Well, in Libet's style, in Libet's experiment specifically, they were asked about the M time. They were specifically trained in both before the experiment even began. Um, I'm not sure whether this is really the case in all Libet experiments. I mean, nevertheless, I would I would like to argue that maybe what they are doing is is they, depending on the order of the reports, they might confuse the reports. I don't know. But mm -hmm. yeah, well, truth, a... truth is what, what Patrick is just saying in the chat that it might just be that we just did not explain what in, intention means to them by just not telling them, which might also be the case. Okay, anyway, thank you for your reply. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna move along, uh, person, all the questions here. So um, also another 
lab made here. So Alice uh, Wong has a question. So in the coin top model, who or what does the conditioning? Does the model assume that the condition placed on a conden conditional intention is the same uh, kind of decision that can be modeled with the coin top model? Uh, I don't know if the, 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 uh, this was clear. I'm sorry, I apologize that the, the, the questions keep going down as they accumulate. So what was the question clear for you, Al and, and Marcel? Do you want me to repeat it or? Uh, I didn't understand. So in the coin top model, uh, who or what does the conditioning, right? Uh, does the model assume that the condition is the same kind of decision that can be modeled with the coin top model? So maybe I, I'm not 100% sure whether I understand the, 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 the um, uh, question, but the, the conditional intention is something that participants form in the beginning of the experiment or before each trial in which they in principle define the conditions under which they um, decide, so to say. So it's not really that they are conditioned. It's simply a kind of if then statement. So if, for example, I experience the urge to act, I will press a key. So you have a condition and then a triggering event that will trigger um, the, the, the intention to act, the proximal intention to act or the action. Um, that is the basic idea. So in principle, it's a kind of strategy that participants use to be able to carry out the task because they have to figure out how they um, can carry out the task in a way. I don't know whether this answers the question. Uh, okay, well, perhaps if Alice wanna, wanna follow up, she, she can ask you in the afterwards or uh, raise her hand. So here, um, I'm gonna, uh, Eddie Namias has his virtual hand uh, raised for a while now, so I'm, I'm going to allow him to ask his question. Go ahead. You're, you're on, uh, Eddie. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, hi, Al. Hey, uh, Marcel, everybody else. Um, great talk, really helpful. Uh, I just want to channel um, the scientific skeptics about free will that I call the illusionists and, and maybe my students when, when we talk about the Libet experiments for a second and just see what, what y'all think about it. So suppose, suppose that your model kind of holds for everything uh, that happens in the decision-making process. And so there's, there's a threshold that say a particular reason has to reach before it comes to consciousness and affects deliberation. And there's a threshold perhaps that the final decision has to cross uh, before it becomes an intention. Um, but of course, for all of those things, the threshold is being reached only because of the buildup of preceding neural activity. And then these, these skeptics are gonna say, but on the sort of model of free will that most people think of, maybe an agent causal model, there, that that's going to look threatening because it's sort of taking determinism and showing us how it works in the brain. And so ultimately the agent is not this uh, extra cause that makes the decision one way or the other. So I guess the question is, is there something this model can do to help address those concerns or should we just go conceptual and say they're, they're misunderstanding a viable way of defining free will? Oh, I should probably take that one, Marcel. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so I, you know, my own view about it is that they're making a, a theoretical error. And if I were a libertarian, I would certainly favor an event causal libertarian view. And our model, uh, you know, fits that kind of view nicely. If I were a compatibilist, um, I would point out that they shouldn't worry about needing agent causation. I don't think, I, I really don't think agent causation makes any positive contribution. Uh, and I think, you know, it should be discarded, but that I can't explain why in two minutes, but you could. No, really... and, I, and obviously I don't want you to, I guess, uh, I guess to make it a little more precise, is there anything about this sort of model that would be helpful in addressing those concerns 
any more than one would have done with the original Libet experiments? Or is it pretty much just the same, the same old problem? Yeah, I see, I see. No, I think that the model doesn't give us any special answer to uh, that kind of theoretical concern. It's a concern uh, that desires more for free action than you can get out of a purely event causal approach. And our approach in our model is event causal. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so I'm just gonna move along here with a question uh, from Corey Fox. So all of this, uh, I guess uh, he meant to say maybe provocative and important in advancing the neurophysiology of decision-making, but it is unclear why this continues to be relevant to any idea about quote unquote free will, or uh, of course, without offering any possible definition of this. Right. So if you do not uh, personally say what it is, then what are you really studying? Okay. Uh, well, I'll take a shot at that. So I am agnostic about the main division in the free will literature, but I can put forward two different sets of sufficient conditions for making a decision freely. And you can choose or, or you can try to improve on me. Um, so one is this. Now, this is just a sufficient condition, a proposal for a sufficient condition. I'm not claiming that these are necessary conditions. But if a person is sane and rational, well-informed, unmanipulated, and makes a reasonable decision on the basis of good information, I say that's a free decision according to a reasonable view of freedom. And you might think, no, you need indeterminism in the decision producing process. And so here's a second proposal. If a person is sane, rational, uncompelled, uncoerced, and makes a reasonable decision, let's say conscious decision, on the basis of good information and could have done otherwise than make that decision uh, in a robust sense of could have done otherwise, that decision is free. So we can give you definitions of free will. Um, as far as free will goes though, we do have Libet's argument and we have you know, powerful objections to it. And we don't need to say what free will is to engage in that enterprise. That's a separate uh, theoretical sort of issue that I'm happy to talk about and that I've written countless books on. <laughs> but that's, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, okay, so um, I saw that uh, Till Birkan had his reign raised for a while there. So, Till, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, lovely talk. Uh, so, I have a little question. Uh, well, coming from a, in epistemology, uh, people worry uh, or have a big discussion about whether we can be responsible for the beliefs that we hold, because people in epistemology think uh, that we can't control whether or not we acquire a belief. Uh, now, interestingly, in your experiments, the way you set up the experiments uh, with your perceptual decisions, the perceptual decisions look a little bit like perceptual judgments. So they look a little bit like it's about the acquisition of a belief. Is this thing going left or right? Do, so do you think that, so that's kind of the question, uh, both to Marcel and, and also to Al, is what's happening there something uh, that's the acquisition of a belief uh, or is something else going on? Uh, is, it, is, is, is it different what's happening there? And Second, second question, I guess Al said at the beginning that uh, deciding is a mental action. Now, if this is about uh, the acquisition of a belief, do you think that the acquisition of a belief is also an action? So are you a doxastic voluntarist uh, or, or would you say, no, no, that, that, I, I don't want to go there. Um, but then if, if it's not the acquisition of a belief, what's happening apart from the judgment which leads to the perceptual belief that this thing is going left or right. Okay, good. I think I'll start, Marcel, if that's okay with you. Um, 
So I think on the handout, I say decisions to do things or, or not to do things. So I'm thinking of practical decisions, not you know, deciding what is the case. About the, uh, the motion and motion detection, Adina gave a talk here years ago and I, I asked her about this. It seemed to me that what's going on is you're making a judgment about which way most of the dots are moving and it's not a uh, practical decision. But suppose what, you're, what the monkey is supposed to do is move its eyes in the direction most dots are moving. Um, then you might think, oh, it is more of a practical decision. And I think Adina convinced me, this is so long ago, I could be misremembering Adina, that it's really hard at that level of things to make the distinction between the practical decision and the epistemic one. Can you help, Adina? Do you recall this conversation? You're, yeah. you're, no, you're muted. Yeah. I don't recall it in great detail. I do recall the, the gist of it. And yeah, I mean, I, I do think that those two things blend together, you know, at this, when you get to these very low, low level tasks where, you know, reporting and what you're reporting are not clearly distinguishable. Um, so uh, does that make me a doxastic voluntarist? <laughs> 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 Sounds like a bad thing to be. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think uh, it looks like if you look at what's happened in the country, it seems like people are doxastic voluntarists. <laughs> so maybe that's the right position to take, even if it's not a normatively justified one. Um, I don't. I don't know. I think I'm going to have to punt on this till because I can't think through it fast enough. Yeah. And maybe they do blend together till I'm not sure either, but if they do, it, it's a complicated issue. I, uh, I used to think until I talked to Adina, no, there's a clear difference between decisions in these two different senses, but I'm not so sure anymore. Yeah, I guess I, it, it's just it. I mean, I, I, I don't want to say that there is a right answer. It's just, it's interesting that obviously in epistemology, so toxastic voluntarism, there are maybe one or two, but it's what, if you look at the kind of the, the, the distribution amongst professional philosopher and epistemologists, there aren't many people who are punting for doxastic voluntarism. It's one yeah. of the things, one of the big questions where there's a pretty strong agreement that doxastic voluntarism is suspect. Uh, so it's interesting uh, that in, in these cases, it, we, we are a struggle uh, to distinguish between forming a belief uh, and uh, making a decision. Uh, and especially in these experiments, the two seem to get blended uh, while, at, and we, we think we are discussing free will. So now, in, obviously the problem is in, in epistemology, people say, well, yeah, you know, uh, moral responsibility, it's all not a problem because we can be responsible for our actions because we control those, but we have no control over, uh, over um, acquiring beliefs. Mm -hmm. But it looks like actually the distinction between the two is much harder to make uh, than, than, it, than it looks like. And especially in these experiments, I think, um, yeah, so maybe either the philosophers need to rethink uh, whether they should be all doxastic and voluntarists or, or something funny is going on. That, that's yeah, it. no, I, I agree. I think and it I, would be a fascinating philosophical research program. Medina, go ahead. I was just going to say w one thing, which is that, you know, on certain views of, of what's going on, when, we, when you look at those kinds of recordings, you're recording from a very specific stage in a hierarchy of stages that, you know, is not limited to what you're looking at. And, um, and at least on certain views, like a hierarchical Bayesian or predictive coding models, um, I think that it's pretty reasonable to think that there, you know, there are strong constraints on development of belief, but they, in ca certain cases, you can override the evidence with top-down stuff. In other cases, it's much harder. And I think um, that you could still, you know, you could have a reasonable story in which doxastic voluntarism as a, you know, global phenomenon is not very believable, but that, you know, at certain levels of the hierarchy, it might look like that's exactly what goes on. So um, mm -hmm. I just think that thinking about belief and decision as a single, you know, a unitary stage phenomenon is not 
uh, realistic and it overly simplifies the kinds of decisions you have to make on, on those philosophical issues. Oh, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to Matthew. So I, I was asked to remind everybody that there's gonna be a little virtual social gathering afterwards where we're gonna use GatherTown uh, and Tian will send a link to everybody. So if you guys wanna meet up afterwards and, and continue the discussion. So now um, we're gonna have three questions. So first I had uh, John Dylan Hayes that uh, raised his, quen, his, ran, his hand sorry, a, a bit ago. So John, the, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, I'd say great talk, um, uh, presenting a position that I hardly agree with, uh, but never mind. Um, uh, so we've got a lot to discuss, not now and here, but there's one question I'd like to ask you, um, because it's a question that is quite important when we discuss these kind of things, and it cropped up in your presentations as well. So it's quite clear, I think, when we think consciously that we've made a decision at least there's something there that kind of some mental events, conscious mental events. I just mean the subjective experience of making a decision now. And it might not even always be present when we, when we make a decision or when we are standing in front of our office door and we want to unlock the door and we don't even think about it, we just automatically act. But my question is, so it's okay at that level, subjective experiences of making intentions. Um, but the question is, what at the neural level is a decision? So if you think about the brain, 86 billion neurons in the average brain, you can think about a long column of numbers, which has 86 billion entries. That is the activity state of every one of these neurons. That's an 86 billion dimensional state space. And what you're doing is your brain is just traveling around in the state space. Uh, so it might be kind of being pushed one way or the other by some noise. It might enter some bifurcation point where if it's here in this subspace, it has a higher probability of moving somewhere else or elsewhere or something like that when you kind of, you call a decision boundary. But I I just really like to know when you say that the, the kid talking about the brain process also expressing some kind of decision, I, just like to know what it is that you mean when you say that the brain is making a decision. Um, if you look at brain states, it seems it's very hard to pinpoint what a decision could even possibly be. Um, and if it's a bit earlier, a bit, a bit later, is it the fact that um, the probability distribution collapses about predicting the subsequent action? Is it about um, uh, just graded probabilities? Is it about causation? mechanisms. So what is it that something is then considered a decision? Because uh, I think it's really important here, if you want to make, move it earlier or later, closer towards the crossing the threshold or earlier, I mean, what's the criterion for this being a decision when we cross the threshold? Um, I think, yeah, I don't know whether there is a real one answer to this question. Uh, Al, I, I, I will start. Okay. Uh, then, then you can try to help me. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know whether there, there, there is one answer to it. When I mean, there are different um, kind of chains of events that um, we are referring to when we talk about the decision. So, for example, the decision in the sense that we, inter we, we present here is the point in time when the um, response is initiated. Presumably, that's a kind of um, uh, decision event that we are re referring to. Of course, you could argue that the decision is... Sorry, Marcel, can you say, what does it mean that it is initiated. I understand that we use these words all the time, but let me just press pause there and say, what does it mean that it's initiated? Because it seems if you go back from the end point, which is pressing a button or moving your finger, you look back at the causal history of that event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does it mean that something is initiated? 
I mean, you, you, you can define it in um, neuroanatomical terms, specific um, activation states of brain areas. So if you go motor, closer to the, to the motor response, it becomes clearer in a way. So at one point, you shoot the, the motor command to your hand in a way. And then you have this point of no return. So this is then an activation state in a specific brain area that has specific consequences on the environment. And of course, you can, you can move that forward and define other mental events in a way that simply describe specific chains of events that follow them with a specific certainty. Of course, you could argue that um, when, when information is integrated, this is part of the decision and that is true. And it's very difficult to define one point when the decision is made. We, I mean, we also argue that you can veto the decision um, after the threshold is crossed in a way. So, so it's, it's a graded thing to some degree. Nevertheless, I think there are specific steps um, that, that one can define functionally. Um, uh, in, in, in these models. And, and I mean, the point of no return is one step. Another step is when the motor response is initiated. Um, yeah, that would be a, my definition of, 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 of decisions. But yeah. So what I'm about to say doesn't answer John's question, but the way I use the word decision, only whole organisms make decisions. So. Monkeys make decisions, people make decisions, uh, brains don't. But I know what you're asking. And some people use the expression neural decision and I can't answer that one. That, that's a question for neuroscientists, I think. Aaron, for example, uses the expression neural decision. Well, but you did, why, didn't, didn't both of you say earlier on that we have this subjective time of decision, and then we have uh, the decision that's made by crossing the threshold at the end of the accumulation. That is the decision. Why is that the decision? Yeah. Okay, I mean, this is when I cross the threshold to, to cross this boundary, I don't enter some next process where I sit, still have uncertainties and modulation and whatever after that. I mean, who says that that is a decision? I, I can understand why intuitively we want to call it a decision, but I think if you want to be a little bit more precise or analytic about it, I think we have to face up with the fact that we don't really know what a re we're going to keep talking about decisions here in the brain. I don't really think that we know what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. And that's probably true. You, you'll notice that what I said is that if people are making decisions in the Libet style scenarios, it doesn't look like they're making them way back at minus 550. But I'm not even sure that they're making decisions. If, you, if they have a conditional intention and the condition is satisfied, you might just get a motor signal. I don't know that there's a decision there. Not in my sense where decisions are responses to uncertainty. But I think that there might be a second aspect to this and this is this conscious intention um, or this becoming aware of the decision. And I think this is in a way kind of artifact of the libertas because usually it, people do not have to become aware of these kind of um, uh, uh, pre-motor states or however you would want to call them. So, um, and I think this was nicely outlined in, 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 in the talk of Adina and, and Aaron, that these kind of, the W judgment is not this subjective experience that you usually have when you do something. It's a kind of metacognitive state that you have to, report because the experimenter wants you to do it. Um, uh, I, uh, and, and I think this is, is crucial because that, um, that describes a very specific type of conscious um, experience of an intention and this metacognitive record. I mean, John, uh, John Dillon, in order to just react to what you, you said, um, I mean, would you say that when a neuron fires an action potential, does that count as an event, as a, as a discrete event, as a as a sort of decision, if you will? The neurons decided that its inputs are adequate. No, I, 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 I actually think that kind of mentalistic talk is very confusing. And I, I think we use it a lot, um, uh, but 
I mean, we use it to our students to describe things, but if we if we're more analytic, um, then I think we have to be very careful with these kind of statements. And I think it might become better if we translate this into a more formalistic language. Um, but I really think that um, uh, this this whole game of saying a decision in the brain is earlier or later versus the subjective decision, I think that doesn't really work. I mean, I think there are properties there about these processes that we can discuss, whether they're probabilities or um, conditional probabilities or whatever. But I just I think this this whole game of early versus late decisions in the brain doesn't make any sense. Well, I mean, whether whether or not there is a decision that happens in, in that way, say that's an empirical question, fine, we don't know. But I think you can come up with a clear definition of what counts as a decision. I mean, like when you well, flip a light exactly switch. That's exactly what I would challenge. That's exactly what I would challenge. I well, think let me step up to the challenge the then. Let me step up to the challenge then, John Dillon. Um, a decision has certain properties among which are hysteresis and an all or none, right? Uh, uh, type of process, uh, 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 in, if you will, a positive feedback loop, and some resistance. So it's like when you when you flip on a light switch. If you don't flip it hard enough, it resists and it doesn't flip. But if you uh, if you persist, it crosses a sort of a threshold where it becomes self reinforcing, and then it's all or none, right? So or like when you push the button on the top of a ballpoint pen, same thing, right? So that's what a decision is. Uh, and whether or not something like that happens in populations of neurons might be a, an empirical question. But if it does, and if you find it and identify it, then it might be, you might be justified in saying that a decision happened. So basically, I mean, I don't want to occupy the whole discussion here, but um, I think if we're talking about earlier or later of something called D or a decision or whatever, we might want to be very clear about what it could possibly be. And I actually think that if you look at a trajectory in the neural state space, you're going to find it very hard to find all these properties. And I think, I, I mean, I could make a list. I mean, I, I don't have problems with kind of uh, coming up with a list of properties I associate with my lay concept of decisions. I just think if we're really serious, we look at these processes, we can't say that there is the decision and then something else happens after the decision. I think that's just very misleading that we, uh, that we frame the problem in this kind of way. That's the last thing I'm gonna say, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, very lively discussion and debates. Um, so I was just told that we might be running a bit out of time. I don't know if we have time. I know that Walter and Patrick both wanted to, to contribute to this discussion. So perhaps, Uri, do we have time for one more question? I'll defer to Patrick. Yeah, so Patrick, the, the floor is yours now. We can't hear you. Can't Patrick. hear you, Patrick. I can ask my question in Gather if we can people hear you. prefer. I, I can do the same. So why don't we move into a more informal mode and go there? Yeah. Okay. So you're all invited to gather town. So Tian posted the link in the, uh, I saw, I see here in the chat. And also Tian, I don't know if you want to send an email again with the link to uh, via the email list and we can all meet over there. Right. Once I end the webinar, everyone will be routed to the, the gather link. So I think we should be good. Super. Well, I, I want to thank uh, both our speakers today for uh, a very uh, interesting talk, a very interesting model. You can see that it sparks lively debate. And thank you all for attending. Um, and I hope to see you all in Gathertown in a couple of minutes. So again, big round of applause to uh, both our speakers and see you all in a minute.